Blog Talk Radio. The funeral is about to begin. The calling hours. When there's no more room in hell, the dead will walk here. They will say that I have shed innocent blood. What's blood for? If not for shedding. Society.com. We'd like to welcome everyone to the show this evening. It's going to be a pretty big show. Format may, may come across as a little different this evening. But uh, just so everyone knows, tonight's show, the October 29th of 2013, the week of Halloween, tonight we are going to be interviewing Barbie Wilde, Nicholas Vince, and Simon Bamford. Those names should be familiar to all of you because in Clive Barker's Hellraiser 2, Barbie played the female Cenobite, Nicholas played the Chatterer, and Simon played the Butterball. In addition to that, Barbie, of course, is the author of the wildly popular book, The Venus Complex. Nicholas and Simon were also in Nightbreed, uh, Nicholas played Kinski, and Simon played Onaka. So we're looking forward to having them on. That interview will probably start around the 8.35 time period, uh, for those of you on the East Coast. It's a great interview. We're going to cover a bunch of topics. Uh, we will be discussing, of course, Hellraiser, the, you know, the news, what if Clive Barker's remake of Hellraiser comes true, you know, Doug playing Pinhead again. We're going to cover all that. And Simon and Nicholas are also going to give us some news on the rumored Nightbreed television series, as well as discuss a little bit about Nightbreed, another Clive Barker film. In addition to that, our Metal Blade Records spotlight is on Hail of Bullets. Their new album is out today, so we will be hearing some tracks from that. And at the end of the show, we're also going to be reviewing Screen Factory's The Abominable Dr. Fibes and Witchfinder General from their Vincent Price collection that came out recently. So we have a lot to look forward to this evening. But just to get it all started, I'm going to do a DVD giveaway. And in that giveaway this evening, we are giving away a copy of John Carpenter's Body Bags on Blu-ray. And we also have a Blu-ray copy of Chilling Visions that is also a Blu-ray. If you would like to be the winner of both of those DVDs, please give us a call at 1-347-237-5099. So we're going to get to our first bit of news for the evening, and it's pretty much going to be the only bit of news. I think it's quite apropos that all of this came about right before the show this week. So it all ties in nicely. And of course, as I mentioned in the opening, the big news, to me, the only really big news that's happened this week it came from Clive Barker himself. And I'm quoting directly from Clive's post from his own official Facebook page. So this is straight from the man himself. He goes on to say, hot from hell. My friends, I have some news which may be of interest to you. A 
few weeks ago, I had a very productive meeting with Bob Weinstein of Dimension Pictures, in the course of which I pitched a remake of the first Hellraiser film. The idea of my coming back to the original film and telling the story with a fresh intensity honoring intensity, honoring the structure and the designs from the first incarnation, but hopefully creating an even darker and richer film was attractive to Dimension. Today, I have officially been invited to write the script based upon that pitch. What can I tell you about it? Well, it will not be a film awash with CGI. I remain as passionate about the power of practical makeup effects as I was when I wrote and directed the first Hellraiser. Of course, the best makeup in the world loses force if not inhabited by a first-rate actor. I told the Dimension team that, in my opinion, there could never be a pinhead without Doug Bradley, and much to my delight, Bob Weinstein agreed. So once the papers are signed, I will open a Le Marchand configuration, dip my quill in its contents, and start writing. I promise that there will be nowhere on the Internet where the news of my progress will be more reliable than here, because only the author of these reports will be your infernal correspondent, me. My very best wishes to you all, my friends, Clive Barker. So, you know, Clive let us all know, of course, that uh, that he is going to be writing the script for uh, a possible remake. And it's, you know, what I love to hear is the fact that he is solidly behind Doug Bradley coming back to play Pinhead. I, I feel like that's there's not even an argument. You know, without without Doug's acting, without the way Doug brought that character to life, Hellraiser I don't think would have had the legs that it had. Even though Clive really wasn't that involved in the series past the second one, you know, you could feel that Doug's presence was what kept the series alive after that. So I love to hear that. Now, Clive also went on to post something uh, later on, and he goes on to say, As questions are asked, I'll do my best to answer them, though, as you all know, making movies is a volatile art, and things seldom remain fixed. One question regarding the rating has been asked. I asked it too, and Dimension confirmed that they are purely interested in an R-rated picture. Somebody else, somebody else asked why I'm not writing something original. The answer is that I am. After Hellraiser, I intend to write and direct a completely new horror movie, which will mingle graphic horror and erotic content, to create an unrated film which will push the envelope of extreme content further than ever. So again, that's that's another great thing. And before we all scoff, oh, they never made Hellraiser PG-13. You know, there's there's a lot of horror remakes that were originally ours that were remade for for PG-13, so that they could expand the audience. So let's let's not fool one another and say that Holly, this is something that Hollywood wouldn't have done. So I think it's great that that Clive has cleared the air immediately to let everyone know that you know Dimension is looking for an R-rated film. He's writing an R-rated film. So we're going to get an R-rated film should this come to pass. I am rather interested about what he's saying about after Hellraiser, where he intends to write and direct a completely new horror movie with erotic horror and erotic content, or graphic horror and erotic content. You know, coming from the mind of Clive, that could certainly be one of the more interesting things that he has probably ever done. I mean, I think it's nice to have Clive back in this capacity, so I love this. But now, before everyone, you know, jumps the train on this, Doug Bradley made a post on his Facebook as well. And this is what he had to say, and he goes, Hi, everyone. Just arrived in Orlando for Spooky Empire to be greeted by the news via Fearnet and Clive Barker's Facebook that he is writing a new Hellraiser script and intends that I should play Pinhead again. This is intriguing news about which I know absolutely nothing. No one has contacted or spoken to me about returning. So until you hear from me to the contrary, assume that, assume that all rumors about me returning as Pinhead are only rumors. Peace and pain, Doug. 
So now we've officially heard from Doug Bradley, who, you know, is saying at this point, you know, nothing's been said to him. And, you know, we can speculate, you know, Doug Doug and Clive could be in on it together, or Doug may know nothing about it at all. You know, there, there's a couple different ways you could look at it. I mean, I think it's... I think, you know, I think it's great that, of course, like I said, that Clive is the one that's going to be writing the remake, that's going to be doing, you know, hopefully directing, and that Doug as Pinhead is, is a key piece. Now, the interesting question that you go from the, from there is, is, you know, do you bring back Chatterer, female, Butterball? Do you bring back the same actors, you know? Should you bring back Nicholas? Should you bring back Simon? Should you bring back Barbie? You know, that's something I, I definitely plan on asking them during the interview, so we'll get answers to that, you know, if they would even be willing to be a part of the series. So, you know, those are all things that we can certainly look forward to later on tonight in the interview. We have to hear it from your own lips. <laughs> so, yes, we shall hear it from their own lips tonight. So, again, you know, you know, where do you, you know, where do we go from here? Is you know is Hellraiser going to be the next eagerly anticipated horror film? I mean, is this is this what we're waiting for? Do we do we want a remake? You know, how is Clive going to go closer to the Hellbound Heart, which the book was originally you know which the movie was originally based off of? So you know, and you know, is it going to be the story of Kirsty again? You know, you know, remake is a subjective word. You know, the Evil Dead. Movie was a re-imaging to some people. It was a remake to others. What is it that we want to see in in the Hellraiser Redux? Do we want a basically new origin story? Could it be done like the Hellbound Heart? I think it could. It would definitely lean. I think it would lean a little bit more towards the erotic. I don't know how much more they can get away with Frank's indiscretions in the book. You know, in the novella. About what he does, you know. Do you flesh out Kirsty and, and Julia Moore in the story? You know. You also have the interesting concept of all the years that Clive has worked on the comic book series. You know, the Cenobites are not necessarily this just evil force looking to take over the world. There's a method behind what it is that they do. And, you know, that's something else that we'll certainly cover this evening when we get to when we get to the interview with Barbie, Simon, and Vince. But because the interview is going to be so long tonight, we're going to speed things up in a little bit. We're going to go ahead and have our first Metal Blade Records spotlight for the evening. Now, the band this evening is Hail of Bullets. Their new CD is out today. It is three, The Rommel Chronicles. And, uh, you know, I found it to be a pretty interesting CD. It wasn't what I would normally listen to in terms of metal, but it is indeed quite brutal and a lot of fun. So, the Metal Metal Blade Spotlight Band is Hail of Bullets. The name of the album is three, The Rommel Chronicles. And the first song will be The Final Front. When we come back, we should be hearing from Mike DeFelipo, who is a fellow writer at HorrorSociety.com and an indie filmmaker. He has a project coming up for an Indiegogo project, so he's going to come on and he's going to talk to us about his project. So once again, we're going to go into our Metal Blade Spotlight. Hail of Bullets is the band. Three, The Rommel Chronicles. The final front. We'll be back in five minutes. Thank you. 
Tonight, the name of the band was Hail of Bullets. The album was Three, The Rommel Chronicles. The name of the song was The Final Front. We will hear a little bit more from Hail of Bullets later on this evening in the show. Don't forget that here in about 10 minutes, we are going to be conducting our interview with Barbie Wilde, Nicholas Vince, and Simon Bamford. All were. Cenobites from Clive Barker's Hellbound, Hellraiser 2. Right now we're waiting on fellow Horse Society writer Michael De Filippio to call in and give us the details on his brand new indie horror film that he is going to be promoting on Indiegogo. So what information I do have about the film, what I do know is the title, and the title is The New List. So once Mike comes in, we'll get some more details from him while we are waiting to conduct our interview with the folks from Hellbound, Hellraiser 2. Now just so you know, just a little bit of promotional stuff. If you guys head on over to HorrorSociety.com, we have many different contests going on. We have uh, Max DVD giveaways. We have the Dead Man's DVD giveaways. I know, uh, I believe Mike is uh, Mike D is also involved with a horror writing fiction contest for Horror Society. So we have a multitude of platforms for you to get published, get yourself noticed, and things along those lines. So if you're definitely looking to get your work featured in the horror industry, please contact us over at HorrorSociety.com and give us the details of your projects. We are always looking to interview new talent, actors, actresses, directors, whatever the case may be. So, like I said, once again, we are we are waiting for Michael De Filippio from Horse Society to call in and give us some details on his new project 
that he will have on Indiegogo soon, and the name of the project will be the new list. But if uh, if Mike is tied up, I think we will go right into our interview segment, and Mike can give us a call later on at the end of the show if if he is available. I know Mike has a lot of work that he's doing, and he winds up on sets a lot, so it's going to be very, very interesting. But uh, again, like I said, uh, this evening our interview is going to be with Barbie Wilde, who was the female Cenobite and author of The Venus Complex. We are also going to be interviewing Nicholas Vince, who was the chatterer and was also Kinski from Nightbreed, and Simon Bamford, who was the Butterball Cenobite, and Onaka from Nightbreed. So we, I think, are going to slide right into that interview. Why didn't you go first? Because you actually knew Clive before the Hellraiser found. That's, yeah, that's fair enough. Um, yeah, so I met Clive at a party in um, Crouch End, uh, where Clive was living at the time, and I had friends because I stud- studied at Mount View Theatre School. Um, and we just met at a party, and he asked me if I'd like to do some modelling for him. And I ended up by modelling for the, his versions of the covers of the Books of Blood. So if you've ever come across the uh, first six volumes of uh, the Books of Blood, um, I'm on the f- cover of the first volume. I'm down bottom right with a knife stuck in my head, <laughs> holding a picture of Clive. Um, and then uh, volume four is, is a portrait of me with, my head open up and needles dropping into my brain. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and then I'd known Clive for about two or three years um, before he uh, asked me if you know, I'd be interested in uh, being in the Hellraiser movie. And obviously I said yes. <laughs> now, Barbie, for, now for you, you came into the role of the female Cenobite um, in the second film. Um, can you tell us how, how you met Clive and how how did you feel taking over a character that had been established in the first film? Well, I I actually didn't meet Clive until about halfway through the filming, I don't think, because he was prepping uh, Nightbreed, I believe, um, and uh, they'd gone with a different director, Tony Randall, and a different scriptwriter, Pete 
uh, Atkins, although it was obviously still based on Clive's mythology, I basically was called up to an audition. And I think probably the reason why is because I was a classically trained mime artist, and I knew that Clive had done a lot of work in the you know mime field and had his own mime company for a while, a theatrical company that used mime. So I think that could have been one of the things that, that was the reason I went along to it. I mean, at the time, I was doing a film review program for ITV called The Small Screen, I was sort of moving into presenting work, so this was quite interesting um, sort of step, you know, back into acting because I'd pretty much decided I wanted to be a TV presenter. Um, from the, and so I went to the audition with, with um, Tony, and, uh, you know, we just chatted, and then, you know, I got the call saying I'd gotten the job, which was amazing because... I think I've said this before, but I didn't even really want to go to the audition because the first film really disturbed me. And it was all Nico's fault. (laughs) (laughs) Because his character really freaked me out. And I think, you know, across the board, everyone says, oh, Pinhead's really sexy. But, uh, you know, it's it's Chatterer that's um, the one that really gives us nightmares. Although I must say, you know, Butterball as well is pretty ew. Um, you know, it's just really an extraordinary film, and there's so much um, talk now of, of going back and, and, you know, the Hammer Horror films and stuff, which, of course, I got to love, you know, as a young kid watching TV movies and stuff. But, you know, there was so much fuss about the first film when it first came out in England because it was kind of like, oh, wow, here's a new British horror movie by this up-and-coming, amazing British writer. And so it was, we all went to see the film. So it was, I mean, it was I, I can't lie to you. When the movie came out, you know, I was I was 11, and it, it blew me away in terms of, you know, what I had seen previously from horror. Now, looking back on it all this time, you know, there have been several films, there have been several sequels, you know, there's even rumors of of a conceivable remake that that Clive may direct or he may produce. You know, all of that's out there. You know, what are your thoughts on how the series has continued on, how it's become so legendary? And if Clive were to be the director, would there be any consideration from either of you of taking back up the roles? Ooh, that would be an interesting question, wouldn't it? Um, uh, I, mean, I, I, I actually I reading... think that... I know, oh, sorry, just very quickly, Nick. I, sure. I think the 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 only way to save this franchise... There are two ways to save this franchise, in my mind, because of what's happened recently, you know, with revelations and stuff, is if Clive stepped back into it. I think it would be wonderful if he directed an, another Hellraiser film. Absolutely wonderful. I know there's a, another one that's called Origins, I think, that they're That's trying right. to, there's the tra- trailers coming out and in Halloween and, and it's, that's really interesting and that's almost like it's this person had this idea and he's just trying to, to get someone to notice him to do it. That could be really interesting. But, I just saw you know, Hellraiser not about ten it. minutes before the show today and I was like, wow, I mean I I didn't know it didn't really say if if Clive was involved or if any you know, anyone from, he, from the previous films and no, he's not as far as I'm aware, Michael, but I think what I find most interesting is Clive has written the Scarlet Gospels, um, which is Pinhead and Harry Moore. Um, so I think what would be fascinating is, as exactly as Clive says, if Clive steps back in. But Clive had said, you know, that he killed off Pinhead. I presume right. it was in the Scarlet Festivals. He put it up on um, uh, Facebook the other day. But, he, you know, he's done so. But it would be really interesting to read the Scarlet Festivals, which hopefully should be out in the next year or so. Um, and that's what's going to head in it. Uh, and it's about having them all. Um, I think it would be really interesting to uh, see what you know, could become of that if that was filmed. Um, as for reprising the role, reprising the role of Chatterer, I I will not fit in the costume. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you have to make a new one. 
<laughs> He'd have to be the intellectual portly chatterer than he was. <laughs> I was only a 32 inch waist in those days. Um, so I think, yeah, it would be. Um, but, uh, but, you know, if, if somebody asked me, if I said to me, oh, Nick, I'm making a movie, uh, would you like to be in it? My answer would be, hell yes. I'm afraid I that Simon I. Would, has joined I would... us. Simon, are you here? Hi, I'm here. Yes, yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. Okay, so now we are officially joined. We have Barbie Wilde, we have Nicholas I... Vince, and we have Simon Bamford. Hi. I just want to say that if somebody did ask me to be in a Hellraiser film, of course, you know, I'd, of course I'd be in it. But uh, it has the part has to be right, as every lesbian would would say. What's that? She should be the female pinhead. It's about time. Yeah, we need a female pinhead. <laughs> well, we're gonna we're actually gonna get to that because of something you wrote, Barbie. But Simon, to get you up to speed, basically the question was, you know, with all the sequels and the remakes wow. and, and you know the rumors of that, you know the hit, the series has just it has survived and has a life of its own. If Clive were to come back as the director for the proposed remake that we've heard rumors of. Would you be uh-huh. willing to reprise your role? Yeah, I just about like um, Nick was saying about fitting in the costume. Well, <laughs> the years have been good to me, so I should easily fit in my costume. <laughs> <laughs> I, might, I might have spit it out a little bit more, but yeah, no, I jump it, John. Um, I've seen some of the concept art that's been um, around on the internet, and uh, it looks awesome. Um, but I think it would need somebody like Clive to be behind it. Um, a hundred percent for it to work, and I think it's his it's his inspiration, it's his genius that made Hellraiser so brilliant. Um, mm-hmm. And it needs that. It needs him at the helm. Mm-hmm. Well, and and it goes without saying too. I mean, I saw the last the last one, and and I love the series. I think Barbie, I think you know that Nicholas, you know that from the um, the written interviews I did with you and Simon. I have your questions. I will I will email those to you as well. But, you know, I, I feel like if they're going to do it, they also need to bring Doug Bradley back. Oh, definitely. Definitely. I yeah. just, you, yeah. That other guy, I mean, it's no disrespect to him as an actor or anything else. There are just certain people that should play certain characters. And when it comes to the commanding presence that, that Pinhead had, he just didn't, he didn't nail it. Doug, Doug just nailed that, so... I hope that if it happens, I mean, I would love to see all of you back in the in the principal roles that you played. I mean, it would it would really be fascinating to see it done right again. Well, I I think that that Doug is his yeah you know he has made the the role him his own, and it's it's not just his performance as well. It's his voice. That voice is just you know you can't copy that. Although I mean, Doug himself is. Doug himself, I think, has said, no, no, I wouldn't want to talk, to, talk for him, but he said that he'd love to see Johnny Depp have a go, you know, which I'm not so sure about that myself. But um, <laughs> I mean, that would definitely be an interesting twist. I don't, you know, <laughs> why not? He's played a little bit of everything else. Yeah, I, bet, I just hope he doesn't bring the, the sort of Jack Sparrow sort of thing to it. That could be really <laughs> a bit too wacky. But, uh, you know, I think it, it's interesting what Nico was saying about the Scarlet Gospels and, and Clive killing Pinhead off. Of course, Pinhead actually died at the end of Hellbound, but he right. managed to come back. <laughs> <laughs> I think I mean, it's a good character that will run and run. Bring everyone back. And, you know, that's what I've always hoped was, you know, even though the three of your characters for all intents and purposes were killed off in the second one. We did see different variations of the chatterer through later movies. Yeah. But, um, and let me ask you guys this because I, I've never, you two have been the ones, uh, Nicholas and uh, Barbie have been the closest to giving me a definitive answer, but I'd love to hear what you all think about the mythos. Like when you read the comics, which Nicholas, you had a lot to do with the comic series and then Barbie, you know, when you wrote Sister Celeste, you know, when when you go back and you you read the context of it, it's almost 
like you're reading the story of the female, you know, what in what do you guys feel like the actual mythos is? Is it what we saw in Hellbound, you know, Hellraiser and Hellbound? Is it more the comics? Is it the short stories that you've written? I mean, what would have, what do you feel is officially the canon of your characters? Well, for me, it was the Hel- Hellbound Heart novella. That mm-hmm. it had to be for legal reasons because um, Clive sold the rights to the film to. Uh, is it New Line? I think you know. Uh, so, dimension. It was New World. Who, New World. Yeah. Um, who, dis- who distributed it? They didn't produce it. But I think it might have been New Line who produced it. But it, yeah. it's now owned by Dimension. Yeah. So, so basically, we were told very firmly that it had to be based on the novella. Now, of course, if you go back to the novella, which is you know a- absolutely brilliant writing, is what would you expect from Clive. You know, I thought I, I keenly noted that the lead Cenobite, which I, I remember from the first time I read it, was female, and so I thought, well, that's interesting. So, um, and Gary, Gary Cunnicliffe, who was one of the makeup artists on on from three onwards, I think, for the Help Razor series, sort of suggested, ah, she could have been a nun, and so that combined with. You know, but as far as uh, Sister Solis for the Hellbound Hearts anthology, I actually almost turned down that opportunity because I was so interested in crime. I didn't, I wasn't interested in writing horror, and because I did write that horror story, that's all I basically have been doing for the last few years is writing horror short stories. But um, th- for me, sorry, it's a long answer. It's okay. It, it, to me, the mythology was based pretty much based on the novella. And and mm-hmm. you know the subsequently the the, the films that, that came out of it, but the first so what, two films. What about uh, what do you think about that, Nicholas? It's interesting. I'm, I'm trying to remember back to when we did the comics. We must have been given a Bible of some form um, and told what we could play with, um, and obviously we were using. Images. I mean, we created a whole load of new Cenobites, um, a whole new load of stories, um, which have you kind of some of them have come on and taken a life of their own. There's a Cenobite called Face, which I didn't write, but which was in one of the early comics, um, and you see him appearing every so often. I think, as as Barbie says, it's Hellbound Hearts. Is the Hellbound Heart singular? Um, is the uh, you know the absolute starting point for all this stuff. But I think what Clive is so generous in his nature and has allowed people to you know, and encourage people to go in and play with these things and to say, okay, well, it'd be interesting to take it and you know, to add this spin to it. Um, they didn't do that with the movies. They took an awful lot of existing scripts and put dropped Pinhead in, um, which is why many of them are just not as successful um, as they could have been. So I think it's, exactly as Barbie says, you really need Clive to get back on board and say, okay, I think this is the definitive, this is what we should be doing. But at the same time, I have tremendous respect for all, you know, the other artists, the other writers, How Loud Hearts all the different comics books, and the new series of comics, yeah, because I only worked on the original series, the Marvel series. Clive has been working with Boom Comics uh, to write more recent uh, uh, issues with Mark Miller, um, etc. So again, it just, you know, there's more life. I think there's always going to be more life, more more stories. Right. Now, now Simon, like your character, and, and I always found this to be a fascinating aspect of the Butterball character, um, in, in the early comics, like like Nicholas was mentioning, Butterball is referred to as the librarian of hell. And <laughs> well, I mean it's I mean even on the collector's figures that were that first came out, um, it says it on the back of the box that Butterball was considered the librarian of hell, and in the comics it references that. Just like in the early comics, if I remember correctly, Chatterer was, was referred to as the masters, the master of, of arms in hell until I believe it was, I want to say it was the character of, not Face, but um, 
there was a Cenobite that that carried machine guns and stuff, and it, it was actually odd oh, to gosh, see. Oh, gosh, I but can't remember, yes. I've got a picture in my mind, yep. I just can't remember his name right now. But, I mean, no. what are your thoughts, Simon, on your character and, and the backstory with him? I mean, how was, how was it portrayed to you to play that character? The librarian thing is actually quite interesting because um, I, I go to see Clive occasionally, and uh, the last time I was there... He had thousands and thousands and thousands of, of little sketches and pictures. Um, and they were all in complete no order whatsoever. And he asked me for a couple of days if I'd sit and, and be a librarian and put them together and try and put them <laughs> in some kind of order, um, which I have to say was was an enormous task. So um, so maybe he was thinking thinking along those lines when he knew that I was coming over. I don't know. I, I was always told that... Um, that, that uh, Butterball was the torturer of, of the group, um, hence why he had this apron full of uh, nasty little tools and things, um, and that he kind of got off on very much on, on giving the pain, although you never really see that in the, in the films. You never, or you just see as the chains. They don't seem to have to do anything. It just kind of will their, uh, their bad feelings and things happen. Um, but that that was kind of my backstory. I think was that I was the torturer, the one that would uh, would go and cut people open and, and make them scream. So I mean, yeah, I mean, it's th- th- go ahead. I was going to say it makes it even more creepy when you realise he's operating on you and he can't see. Yeah, um. <laughs> and, you know, and that's and that's another interesting aspect that I, I wanted to give you know to talk about. You know, since you guys brought up the the novella and everything, you know, Clive's description of their disfigurements and and the things that they do, how challenging was that? Especially, you know, Nicholas and um, Simon, there's there's a noticeable difference in your character's makeup from the first film. Um, in particular, mm-hmm. like in particular with Chatterer, like you see you see more of his eyes in the second one than you ever did in the first one. And you know, Simon, your eyes are basically sewn shut. And I know yeah. Barbie's makeup was was modified as well. If you look at the pictures, you can see a, a progression in the makeup. Um, in particular, for Simon and Nicholas, you know, with the changes, did the changes in the makeup make it easier for you to portray your roles, or, or was it more difficult? And Barbie, with your makeup, um, can you talk about the thing that you notice the most is around the throat and the wiring that runs from your face? Can you talk about some of the restrictions you had with that as well? Um, who should go first? <laughs> Ladies, whoever wants to. Ladies first, yeah. Okay. Um, it was very restrictive. Um, at, funnily enough, it was the, the back collar of the costume, uh, which, of course, hid a lot of, you know, my hair coming out, the the skull cap and all that kind of stuff. You notice that a lot of people who have to wear skull caps often have high collars in their costumes. You know, the um, Persis Kambata in the first Star Trek movie. She actually shaved her head, but she still had the sort of big collar. Um, it, I found that very... The, the costume was actually you laced into it, and it was kind of... Um, very restrictive. The the makeup was um because it's glued onto your face, um Simon and uh Nico had they pulled masks over their heads and so there was a little bit of air circulating in there, not much I believe. But you know, the the first time they took the makeup off T- took the makeup off. My skin was pink, and I asked my makeup artist, "Oh wow, my skin's pink!" And he said, "Yeah, oxygen starvation." So it was it was a very restrictive. Um, makeup and costume but you know it's just you're playing a demon from hell so you sort of ha- that has to be part and parcel of the the performance and so looking into the mirror and Doug has said this too it's like the first time you see yourself in full makeup looking like that it is very strange and I think especially for a woman you know I was bald and I had these sort of fake skull bits and you know this huge rather dubious wound in my throat, and it's like, bloody hell. <laughs> so that does, again, that, that informs your performance, to use actor speak. Yeah. Oh, see, and I love that being an effects artist. I love I love it when, when my subjects get out of the chair and go look in the mirror the first time. The expression is usually just priceless. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but, um, 
Simon, with, with you, I mean, how was it with your makeup? Like I said, because your character, one of one of his physical deformities is the fact that his eyes are sewn shut. Yeah, now, um, that... we, we never, Nick and I never had that wonderful reveal moment because we were blind in the makeup, so uh, we, we had no eye holes um, in the first film, anyway. Um, by the second film, I asked them if the uh, if the character was going to take his glasses off, um, and they came back eventually and said, "No, he's not." So I gouged little holes in the uh, in the makeup so I could see something, but they were it was very restricted. And then of course they put the dark glasses on, so it was virtually blind anyway. Um, but it was I always thought it was a great shame because I think an actor does bond with the way they look, especially when you have such extraordinary uh, makeups on. Um, and 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 because mine was kind of two inches thick foam latex inside of it, um, if if I distorted my face to its absolute extreme. The makeup virtually did nothing at all, <laughs> so it was very restrictive on that. Um, although you in probably the end, wore I mean, that. Your makeup was probably the heaviest, though, weren't you? Because you're not a heavy set person. And no, Waterball no, I was, was, a, was a larger character. Yeah, I mean, they wanted somebody skinny inside of it. I was only 23, I think, when we when we made Hellraiser One, um, and I was a skinny little thing. Uh, but the, he had a very deep uh, wound in his stomach which uh, I could get my whole hand into as though I was playing with my whole inside. Um, and they could only do that by having a, a skinny actor inside a big costume. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't really heavy. Uh, foam latex isn't that heavy, you, you know that. Um, it was just uncomfortable. But, and there were no ear holes either and no nose holes. So um, I always describe it as like sensory deprivation for 14 hours a day, just kind of sitting with your own thoughts, um, trying not to go gradually mad. <laughs> now, Nicholas, how about for you with the differences between your makeups in the in the two films? Yeah, I mean the I mean the great thing you only really see it at the very end that um, just before he dies that Chatterer has got eyes. Um, there was a reveal scene that got cut along with uh, another scene where Chatterer was chasing. Um, Kirsty down a corridor underneath the um, hospital, um, which is why it was done. They wanted to make Chatterer more aggressive. And when Clive originally spoke to me about the character, he said that um, as, um, Simon was the uh, torturer in the group, then Chatterer was the family dog. Um, cause it's Chat- <laughs> cause it's I've Chatterer read that before, who, actually. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, Chatterer is uh, is the only person who actually touches anybody uh, in the first movie. Um, as Simon says, it's all you know the flying chains and so on. But Chatterer actually physically manhandles uh, Kirsty uh, in the first movie. So I mean, it, it, you know, I was delighted by the second. Um, version of the makeup because I could actually see um, <laughs> properly see and walk forward. As it turned out, it was only in one scene, um, and then I got killed. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the way that the, the cookie, cookie crumbles. Yeah, I, I think the, the <laughs> that's the way the Cenobite crumbles. Um, I think crumbles. the the other reason, you know, obviously the the first actress Grace Kirby was very different looking to me um and so that that's another thing that informed the makeup changes as well they thought well you know there, there's no way we can make barbie look like grace did because our bone structures were i mean she's got great cheekbones and all that sort of stuff so but it was it's like they, they just decided sort of on a new face that was based on my my a new makeup based on my facial things as well. And I don't have the creepy little bits of hair that were coming out of her her mm-hmm. skull makeup. <laughs> I always thought that was one of the really creepiest bits about her. Um I think her, her neck jewelry is prettier though because it's it was the three prongs right. coming out rather than just the one. But hey. Um, the Trinity, the Trinity. What was that? So again, Simon? What? It's the Trinity, the three. It's the Trinity, isn't it, again? Oh, <laughs> yes, the there we religious go. connotations. Yeah. 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 Well, let me... Why am I only one? <laughs> Doug, Doug always said, me... actually, that um, we needed to do very little anyway. He was always being told to Clive to do less and less because the makeups were so extraordinary. 
that you you didn't need to do very much for the camera because the more you did, the more it weakened, uh, and the less you did, the more it strengthened the characters. Um, and I think that was very true for all four of us, actually. Yeah. The less we did, the powerful we were. Now, let me yeah. ask you guys this, and, and this, I mean, it's kind of a Hellraiser question, but it, it's it's not, but... One of the things that that seems to be a common thread, having looked through your guys' IMDb's web pages and things like that, is you guys have all done time with theater in in one capacity or another. Mm-hmm. How do you guys feel like your your theatrical your stage work helps you with your film work, and in turn? Like you guys had mentioned, you really didn't have to do a lot in terms of dialogue or anything with the characters, but how did you draw on your theatrical training for the characters since it was more movement than it was anything else? Well, I, 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 as Bobby said, she's a classically trained mime artist. Um, uh, when I was at uh, drama school, we did quite a bit. We did mime lessons in mime and mask work. Um, I remember we were told to bring in a cardboard box to put over our heads uh, for one lesson uh, in a moment. We weren't allowed to mark the cardboard box or draw a character's face on anything, but we had to make the cardboard box into a believable character. Um, and I think I found, I think I found that very helpful with Chatterer. That, you know, it is all to do with body. You, you know, it's your entire from the soles of your feet right up to the top of your head. Everything is a, goes into being that character. How about for you, Barbie? Or Simon? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I was just going to say, uh, Nick, Nick and I trained together, actually, at Drama College, um, and that there was one uh, thing that we did uh, where they brought in some sellotape or some, some scotch tape. I don't know what you call it over in the States. Um, and they just kind of altered a slight bit of Nick's face. They just pulled, and his whole character changed. It was quite remarkable. I've never forgotten it. They just slightly altered a tiny bit of his face, what? and this monster came out. It was amazing. It was. Yeah, I remember that lesson very well. Um, I remember the lesson, the reaction of the actress who was with me, who was oh. Beverly, I think, um, <laughs> and she was practically in tears. Um, and all they did was they took, it was, actually I think they used, it was either sellotape or they may have used plaster, um, uh-huh. uh, uh, first aid plaster, and it was, they took the tip of my nose and pulled it upright and sellotaped it to in between my eyebrows, so it's kind of pig-like. Um, and it was an extraordinary transformation. To, yeah, I'd forgotten that, Simon. Um, it was. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> extraordinary. <laughs> You must have looked like that guy on League of Gentlemen. <laughs> yes, yes, I did. You're absolutely right. Um, it was tremendously freeing. I remember that much. I remember, you know, the actual experience, having your face altered like that. Um, I mean, I've just written recently in the annotated book. It's called Cabal and Other Annotations. Um, it's a limited edition um, published by Fiddleblack.org. Um, which has got Mark Miller, and it basically is the Cabal, the Book of Cabal, with some um, essays um, by those of us at the time, and I tell the whole story of how Chatra, the design of that makeup, um, is all in that article. Um, but I'd forgotten that incident, so I mean, I should, yeah, that was very interesting. It, you know, transforming your face actually does have an effect on your personality, I think. Yeah. How about for you, Barbie? Well, it, it's interesting. I just remembered that um, when I first came to, to England uh, to study drama, and then I was offered a place in this mime company uh, called Silence, S-I-L-E-N-T-S. And they were the biggest mime company in the UK at the time, as far as numbers were concerned. I mean, we still did little t- tiny fringe venues, but the show, the major show that we did was called Visions of Hell and Other Stories. And this is way before Hellraiser, and I just remembered this, thinking, well, oh, that's so interesting. Um, our, our guy, had, our leader had worked with uh, Decru in Paris and stuff, and, and at any one time, I was actually working in 
three mime companies. One was um, uh, Silence. The other one was called Drawing in Space, which I did with my my um, then partner Tim Dry. And um, what was the third one? Well, the third one was was Shock, which was a mime music, bur- almost like a burlesque kind of um, singing group. We supported Gary Newman, and we signed to RCA Records. But we had a because. Tim and I and um, Sean Crawford uh, were classically trained mime artists. It was a, very much a mime dance music group. So that that was my background, and that's what I'd been doing for years. Um, and the I think the whole idea of speaking, I actually find it kind of, not terrifying, obviously, because I'm sitting here on the radio talking to you guys, but... Um, <laughs> I think I think I talked mentioned this with when we were doing Grimfest um with Nico. Um mm-hmm. you know, I, I actually have a terror of, of forgetting my lines, which I share with a good many great actors. I'd like to think not that I'm a, a great actor, but I would stuff the script into my Leotard or something, you know, so I'd always have it available. <laughs> And that's why I find mime so comforting because I could always remember movements and dance as well. Um, so it, my first actual speaking part um, was in a, a, a play, again on the fringe, um, the Barons Court Theatre, which I believe actually um, <clears throat> uh, Dean Drinkle directed uh, Clive's play, Frank- Frankenstein in Love. Uh-huh. Is, yeah. Is that, yeah. yeah. Uh, that was the same theatre, and it was called The Impressionist Room, and I played an annoying woman who couldn't stop talking in the Impressionist Room of the National Gallery and stuff. And I I never forget, I was running lines with my partner, and he said, you'll never remember all these lines. Very helpfully, thank you. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's what these people on set, don't you? You know? No, no, he's very sweet. I mean, he was concerned for me. I funnily enough didn't. I think I just had one little moment when I forgot a line. But to do something, it actually... As much as it was exhausting doing the whole makeup process, it was actually kind of relaxing because we didn't have much many lines. We had to have a presence, which I was well, you know, trained for. But um, I think that was one of the great things about um, doing Hellraiser is that you, you everything had to be put across in a powerful way through your presence. Rather right. than the lines, yeah. and and that's certainly what you took was you know because I mean the female had a few speaking bits here and there. Pinhead primarily had most of the speaking roles, but it was it was still noticeable how much power and presence you guys commanded any time you were on the screen. You always felt like, oh shit, this is it. I'm you know I'm dead. And you know, I think that was that. That's a very big thing for the characters, and it, and it says a lot about how you guys portrayed them. But um, I, I, I promise you, we were you, also, we were also lo- looking back. We were helped by um, pretty much every special effect that they had in those days. There were wind machines, there were chains, there was dramatic lighting, there were walls kind of cracking open. Um, I mean, we we always had fantastic entrances, kind of designed for us. Uh, every trick in the book was was helped. It was thrown in to help us. I think uh Absolutely. And and as Simon has said before as well, of course, you know, we owe all this to the wonderful and talented artists, the makeup artists. Yeah. Um, image you know, animation. Inspired by yeah, the image animation, uh inspired by Clive, um, to create these uh wonderful masks. Um but, you know, these iconic images. there was one thing I meant to say earlier on, um you were saying that um, Barbie said that um, Chatterer was the scariest Cenobite. Um, I happened to be at an event with Neil Gaiman the other day. Um, it was a bit of a surprise because I hadn't seen Neil for 25 years. Um, oh, wow. When he re- realized <laughs> um, <laughs> it was a literary lunch. And um, uh, Neil just looked at me and said, it's Nick Vince, the Chatterer, the scariest Cenobite. Well, I promise you we wouldn't talk Hellraiser the whole time, and we're not going to. So I want to ask you guys a little bit about your literary work, and, and all of you have some. Um, 
Barbie, let's start with you. I mean, it's of course, you know, we had brought up Sister Celise and 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 all that. But why, I want you to tell everyone a little bit more about the Venus Complex and what went into you writing that book. Right. Well, it's it's basic. At its most basic level, it is the diary of a serial killer. But the one thing I wanted to to explore, and I felt hadn't been done to my satisfaction anyway, was his sexual mindscape. What were his sexual thoughts? Because fictional serial killers, are, you know, and I enjoy them too, Hannibal and Dexter and all these people, they seem to have almost like a superhero quality. They, they do these more grotesque and extraordinary murders. But, you know, really, if you, one of the things I really wanted to ground my serial killer in was reality. And so I, I researched a huge amount. I interviewed homicide detectives in, in um, Manhattan North, I talked to forensic psychologists and, um, you know, read tons of books about serial killers and even writings by serial killers to, to give my character a, you know, a grounding in reality. And also just to, you know, find out what his sexual thoughts would be and his sexual fantasies. And it's kind of, you start, you meet him after he's had a, a car accident that he's he's created and, you know, he's killed his wife and he's just about survived. And you just witness his sort of spiraling down. And then he sees this woman and he goes, wow, I'm in love with her, but I can never talk to her because I'm too shy and all this sort of stuff. So he conceives of this plot to um, create these murders that could get him involved in the investigation because she's a forensic psychologist. And because he's an art historian, did I say hysterian? <laughs> historian. He's, um, I quite like hysterian. He's hysterical though. about art. So do I. Um, <laughs> he uses his favorite paintings of Venus as his template for his murders. And um, when I created this book, because there are sex scenes in it, obviously, because I wanted to be realistic, because he's a sexual serial killer. And I thought I'd get some, you know, nasty reviews, but I've been very pleased to see that People like uh, Fangoria, Scream, and I've just gotten a, a great review in Rue Morgue. <laughs> that, You're going to um, have one on Horror Society soon, too. I, I've yeah, ordered my copy of the book for review. So. Well, I just, I just love this. It's like Wilde expertly charts Michael's diabolical descent into voyeurism, stalking, and murder in a trans- transgressive tale that would make Patron Bateman blush. And I went, <laughs> Bloody hell, that's lovely. <laughs> so I've had a lot of wonderful... Because <laughs> when I read American Psycho, I actually found that book it had many repellent book bits in it. Me, you know, because I've, I've read a million, you know, Quantico profile reports and stuff. So I I thought, well, that's interesting because you know, I'm not saying it's worse or better at anything. In many ways, you can't really compare the two. But, you know, he has his rants. He, he, I think he's very funny, actually, um, in some of the things he says. And um, he's very political. He's very non-PC in the way he looks at the world. So it's not just about his crimes. It's about the, the human and what made up this human, um, what, what caused him to become this. And, and a friend of mine who's... You know, she she works as an agony aunt, actually, and I didn't think she'd like the book, but she said, I found it fascinating because I always wondered what made these people turn into it, and your book seemed very plausible to me. So th- so that's what it's it's about, basically. And I just wanted to take it that one step further um, to to explore things that I felt weren't explored in fictional serial killers. Well, like I said, I mean, I'm certainly looking forward to uh, to getting my review out there, so... You'll have another one to add very shortly. Oh, great. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Not a problem. Um, Nicholas, of course we had mentioned the, um, you know, the Hellraiser comics. Um, you had uh, done some work on the, uh, the Nightbreed comics as well. There was uh, Warheads. Uh, but you also were part of a short story book called What Monsters Do. No, um, I wrote what? No, no, Michael, I wrote what the monsters do. Okay, you wrote, wrote the whole all, thing. Okay, the way I I'm reading the, whole the description thing. on here. Okay, so, go ahead. Um, <laughs> uh, the, uh, yeah, the, so um, 
What Monsters Do is my first collection of short stories, um, seven short stories, um, which uh, very nicely uh, received. Like you know, as Barbie says, it's always really nice when you receive nice reviews. Um, and I just, within a week and a half, in fact, not this weekend, the following weekend, um, two of those short stories are being presented in a show um, as two one-act plays uh, oh, wow. at the London Horror Festival. Uh, it's uh, at the Etc. Theatre in Camden Town on Friday the 25th to Sunday the 27th of October. Um, tickets are going very well, so you do please come along and support it, um, those of you who are in London, um, because it, I was privileged enough to uh, watch a run-through of it Yesterday, we were actually at the theatre uh, yesterday, and it was the first time I'd seen them for a week and a half, um, and the show's really coming together um, wonderfully well. Um, and I took the cast out for dinner afterwards, and one of them asked me, and said, you know, what is it like seeing your plays on stage in front of you? I just said, it's disturbing. <laughs> it's really. <laughs> it's it's, it's, it's just as funny. It's not quite the response I thought you'd have, but. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it's disturbing because they're disturbing stories. And, you know, they've got to the stage now that um, I, I reckon, you know, I know when they've, they've said the wrong line, um, but they make them, you know, they've made the plays their own. Um, and they're very effective. I'm really, really pleased with them. Um, so, yeah, so um, that's, those, that's the next thing that's happening with those. I'm in negotiations uh, with a film company about filming one of the stories, the first one in the book, actually. Um, very nice. We're, we're talking about, yeah, yeah. Um, and then uh, I've just, putting the finishing touches to the second volume of short stories, Other People's Darkness. That's what I'm working on. I was getting ready to ask you about that. Yeah, yeah. I'm working on that. I've got one more story. I've just finished a a rewrite of one of the short stories after feedback from my editor. Um, And I'm now... I've just got the last story to finish. I'm about two-thirds of the way through the last story. Um, uh, the, The ones that will go into the the next collection. That one's called Other People's Darkness, and I'll make an announcement in the next two or three weeks about when that's going to be available. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's writing and um, acting. I did some acting again for the first time in years, tw- over 25 years, um, for one of the entries for AB- uh, the public competition for ABCs of Death 2. Oh. Um, that should be available online fairly shortly. Um, and I've got, hopefully, I should have about five days filming next month on two other projects. Three are confirmed. I'm just waiting to hear about the other two um, uh, in November as well. So it's, it's kind of all happening at the moment, not just literary-wise, but it's kind of other projects as well. And, you know, others that are too early to talk about, but uh, trying out new things. Um, well, I have one more big one for you, and, and after we get Simon to answer this, uh, mm. we'll, we'll get to we'll get to the close of the interview. But um, Simon, now let, now let me ask you. Um, I've been researching, and I haven't found where you've done any fictional work based on anything that you've done. But I I did see where uh, you were a theater reviewer for the stage since 2006. Um, yeah. How would you? How would you, and I know Barbie, you know, all three of you guys have done outside work as writers and reviewers and interviewers and and things along those lines. Um, Do you look at reviewing stage, you know, reviewing theater as a break from the norm, or do you consider that more your regular job? I I I would say it's a break from the norm for me. Um, It's... It's it's kind of a way of getting your own back as well, which is really nice. I've been reviewed kind of thirty years to kind of reverse the uh, reverse the roles um, is is very powerful. But um, I, I'm always a very kind reviewer. Um, I have to say I, I, I tend to be generous 
uh, because I, obviously as an actor, you know what people have been going through and how they've achieved it. And if I do something, if I do see something that I think needs mentioning or criticising, I'll do it in the kindest way that I can possibly put it, so that reading between the lines, you could see that maybe there was a big criticism there. Um, I, I'm not a nasty reviewer, so I probably will never get very far as a reviewer, to be honest, because I think it's only the nasty one. It's the Simon Callows uh, that, that everybody remembers, you know. Um, no, but I'm, I'm mainly I've done uh, performing and acting. I've, I've done that for the last 30 years. Um, I've done a few short films this year and a, a voiceover for uh, an animated um, a film called uh, The Eleventh Hour. Um, and I've got a, a film premiering at the British Film Institute in a couple of weeks. Um, you have you kept that pretty quiet, Simon. Uh, it's <laughs> <laughs> it was great. I spent a few days being absolutely horrible to a ten-year-old boy, just shouting at the top of my voice. I started off just being kind of mean to him, and by the end of it, they just kept pushing me to go further. They wanted me to be virtually at the point of hitting this poor little child. Um, so the, the performance got bigger and bigger and bigger, and I got nastier and louder and horrible. So I'm really looking forward to seeing. <laughs> How, how it works out and whether, and whether it's completely over the top on film. <laughs> Simon, is this, the, is this the movie that had Robin Vision working yeah, on it? that's right. That's right. And what's, uh, what's it called? Pars- Parson and Son. Oh, brilliant. Parson and Wonderful. Son. Wonderful. And this is part oh, yeah. of the, is it part of London Film Festival? Yeah, London Film Academy. Yeah. London Film Academy. Yeah. Can we get tickets? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> I'd rather sit for I'm a... I'm going to get uh, Google. I'm part of the BFI. You know what I'm, it's like. I'm a member of the BFI. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. Like I said, we're getting close to the end of the interview, so mm-hmm. I only have a few more questions. But now, um, I, I Michael, have a bit can one... I just... I'm so, oh, sorry. No, please Can I just ahead. add one couple more little things cuz one of them's Please. really important i'm involved in the women and women and horror calendar uk 2014 and it's all women from the uk who are um involved in every level of horror obviously it's not a pin up cuz i'm in there but some very beautiful women are also in there but it's all for a very beautiful woman uh well it's all for charity it's for rape crisis and uh, the Sophie Lancaster Foundation. And if you go to Facebook and just put in Women in Horror Calendar UK, it'll pop up. It's going to come out on sale. And just keep an eye on my Facebook page. It's going to come out soon, and it's all for charity, and it's, it's a wonderful thing. Also, I do have my first zombie story coming out in Gore Zone 29. Nice. Fangoria's, Fangoria's Gore Zone is back with a vengeance. Yes, it is. And, and so, um, so that, that that's just the you know, and it's also coming out in a in a um, uh, an anthology called the Beast Bestiarum Vocabulum. And Nico and I both have stories in another anthology this year called the Nico <laughs> Demonological <laughs> Biblica. The de- Demonologia Biblica. Right. Demonologia Biblica. So it's oh, it's tongue twisters. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I just wanted to put those little things in. So I'm sorry for interrupting. No, it's quite all right. And Al, I was going to tell you all before we got off the air, but I'll go ahead and let you all know. Since we communicate on Facebook and Twitter with one another, any projects you guys have, like Barbie the Calendar, um, the books, anything you guys do, if you need it up on Horror Society promoted, just drop me a line. You guys know that you're always welcome to do that, and I'm more than happy to promote your work. Fantastic. I have a press release all ready to go. I'm just waiting for one more JPEG. <laughs> all you got to do is shoot it to me, and you know I'll have it up and promoted. So, so like oh, I said, we're getting close to the – not a problem. We're getting close to the end, and I have – my fans would kill me if I didn't ask Simon and Nicholas about this before we go. This is one of the final questions. We are finally getting the cabal cut of Nightbreed. Yay! Yay! Yeah. My friends at Scream Factory are releasing it. This is, I know, something that has been wanted for years. You know, something that Clive wanted. I'm sure the actors have wanted, and of course, the fans have wanted. Um, when you guys look back at Nightbreed and 
you know, just how much clamoring there has been for this cut of the film. What are your thoughts on that film's, you know, rabid fan base? Have you guys been asked to be a part of the special features for the Blu-ray? And have you guys heard anything about the potential rumors of it being turned into a television series? Mm-hmm. Yes, There's yes, rumors, yes, mind yes. you. There's been a lot of rumors about that. Yeah. I think the answer is uh, like yes, yes, about, yes. <laughs> I saw the rumors about the TV series on Clive's website, so I assume that there is um, some truth in that, although um, how far that gets to, 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 to proceed very much probably depends on, on how successful the Cabal cut is when it's released, I would think. But certainly there's, there's enormous, uh, there's a wealth of, of, of stories there that would just make a fantastic episodic television series with each one being followed. It would be brilliant. I think it's a wonderful idea. And yes, we, I, I assume you, Nick, we, we're supposed to be recording the, uh, uh, the special features interviews in a few weeks' time, I think. I, yeah, nice. we just waited. We were asked, we were asked to put some dates aside for October, and they yeah. haven't happened. So <laughs> we're we're just waiting. I know. I'm I, I saw... Sorry, Simon. Go on. Yeah, go on. I was just uh, funny enough. Neil Gaiman mentioned the other day that uh, he's uh, recorded uh, an interview for the Cabal Cut. Um, oh wow! Because Neil. Neil was part of the crowd scene when we did the bar scene with Anne Bobby. Uh, Neil was part of that. Um, and the reason I'm... I was hesitating. Whilst Simon was talking, that was great, because I can tell you more about the TV series. Um, mm-hmm. That being steered by a gentleman called Michael Plumides, uh, mm-hmm. who... Uh, is responsible for a film called Ghost Trek. Um, and Michael was with us at Dragon Con uh, and talking about it. And I think what they were, he was saying was that they're going to finish doing the TV series of The Exorcist, and once that's done, then they hope to move on to uh, the Nightbreed TV series. Um, so that was a couple of Can't months wait. ago. So. Yeah, no, I, I, exactly as Simon says. I mean, it'd just be extra, you know, what you can do now um, with makeups and uh, special effects on television, you know, it would be just be amazing. But, I mean, well, I mean, you know, if, you look at the, if you look at the things that, you know, I don't, you know, we could, we could get into the whole video nasty thing, trust me. It's, it's <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how television is over in England, but, I mean, over here in the States, if, you know, with what you're able to get away with now, if you look at shows like The Walking Dead, I don't think mm. there's any reason why you couldn't do an excellent, excellent TV show based off of Cabal. You know, I, I, so, uh, I mean, absolutely. The quality uh, of uh, television and, and storytelling on television now is, has moved forward so far and, and has, has really found a level of excellence that, that would really suit itself to, to the Cabal. Well, I was li- I was listening to David S. Goyer, uh, the man behind Superman. He was a, a, a funny enough at the BFI, Simon, and he was saying that a lot of screenwriters are now moving towards television mm-hmm. because you get longer to develop. You don't have ninety minutes, to one hundred and twenty minutes to tell your entire story, develop your characters, etc. You 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 could have five weeks, you know, ten hours to um, yeah. develop all your characters, your stories, and so on. Um, so I, I, I think the whole prospect of a 90 TV series is extremely exciting. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'd like Simon, just uh, really looking forward to seeing the Cabal Cut and uh, doing the interviews. Well, same here. I'm, I'm already on the short based? list. To... Go ahead. So, I'm sorry, is it, uh, is it going to be based in the United States? The TV the Cabal, the, the, I have no idea, uh, no idea at all. Um, the original Cabal was said, well, they filmed it in Canada, didn't they? In, um, in, uh, yeah. Oh, man, Cabal, I mean, Cabal yeah, that was, was back when, they, when there were a lot more tax breaks for taking your film to Canada and having a mostly Canadian crew. Uh, yeah. The book is set in Sheerneck, north, you know, kind of, kind of over into Canada, uh, the very, very north oh. of America. 
the original story is set um, set there as well. Um, so I think that's fair enough. <laughs> you know, there's a night breed around the world. I know there are a night breed around the world. Sure, that would make sense. I mean, I think that would be a great episode. I mean, you know, just a great oh, episodic it. series. There's so much you could do with it. You could have them Skyping and Facebooking each other. <laughs> well, let me, get, let me get let me get to the last questions because I, I know I've sure. kept you guys a little bit over, and I apologize for that. But the fans are going to love this. Um, let me ask you this to round out the interview. With with not only your literary work, your theater work. You know, you take into account working with Clive on the Hellraiser series, um, you guys with um, Nightbreed. When you guys go to conventions, are you are you still are you surprised or are you still surprised by just how much people love your work and and the characters that you've portrayed? And you know. What do you hope fans take away from your all of your work as a whole? And Barbie, we'll start with you on that. Um, well, I I must admit, when I first went to uh, conventions in the United States, I I thought, oh, is this you know a good idea? Would Americans know about Hellraiser? I mean, I know that the film the filming of the Hellraiser uh, franchise went over to the states for three, um, but it was just I was always so touched by everybody's respectful and wonderful attitude, um, especially in America. Not that, not saying that European fans aren't wonderful too, but I was just kind of surprised that the, it had become such a cult favorite in the United States. Thank you, you know, the horror channel and late night TV. So, yeah, I am. I was surprised because when we were making the film, even though I was just involved in the sequel, and so if you're in a sequel, then that's pretty successful. You're on a roll. But right. you know, still a fairly low budget British horror movie. And to to get the kind of recognition from, you know, fans worldwide and stuff like that, South America and all these places, um, it it is it's absolutely wonderful. I think it's it's lovely and it's very touching and I think it's because of we've been involved in a, a mythos created by a, a real genius. You know, very unusual writer who who reached into an extraordinary source and brought out some amazing characters and it's brilliant. And what was the second uh, part of your question? <laughs> <laughs> I mean I think you pretty much you pretty much nailed it all right there. I mean I, w- I was wondering okay. what you thought about about, you know, coming over you know, the conventions and, and, and the people loving it. Uh how about you, Simon? I've, I'm always surprised that there is a, a younger audience that is still coming up, that is still seeing the film. Um, I was at a convention over the weekend, and I, I was amazed that the, the average age was probably in their 20s and 30s. Um, but they'd all seen Hellraiser, and it still works. It seems to um, cross the kind of borders of, oh, I'm not going to see that because it's uh, it's uh, as an old film. Um and, and I think people take away from it the fact that you can you can be completely visionary, you can be very new. You don't have to follow the old formulas of teenagers um, having a party. You, you can just find new ways of connecting with people and 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 shocking people. And and like and like Bobby says, uh, if you've got some element of genius, it's amazing where you can go with it. Yeah. Nicholas? Yeah, I think the... Yeah, I, I'm always amazed. I think when people present tattoos on their calves of your characters and ask you to sign their calves uh, because they said, right, I'm now going to get that tattooed, that's always very moving, actually, um, and a real testament you know, to the power of these stories, the power of these images, and I think that's something to touch on. Um, with the Nightbreed TV series and so on, it's obviously not going to be about special effects to make it successful. It will be the stories. And it will be the storytelling that actually really makes the um, these things successful. Exactly as Simon says, the reason why Hellraiser has uh, survived um, is because it's not a stalk and slash um, and the line I use is, no teenagers were harmed during the making of this movie. 
<laughs> which makes it which makes it very different to a lot of movies that were around um, when Hellraiser was was made. Um, so I'm, I'm like the rest of the guys. I'm very grateful to Clive um, for giving us this amazing opportunity, mm-hmm. um, and it's always delightful to meet people who are interested in your work um, and you know being able to talk to them and hear when they first saw it and how it's affected them and you know what they like about it and so on. that's always very gratifying um, and, and fun well again I want to thank you guys for coming on you've been fantastic guests I'm fans of all of your work um, you'd be looking for reviews of the book works coming here very soon um, we'll just go around um one of our guests, Barbie Wild, uh, do you have any place if fans want to check out your work, websites, Facebook, anything like that? I certainly do. I just want to say thank you, Michael, for a wonderful review. You know, it's been it's been great to finally sort of chat to you in the flesh. It's, although it's not really in the flesh, is it? Um, <laughs> um, it's nice to hear voices. You- <laughs> to chat you with, uh, vocally through the, the internet ways. Um, yes, you can go to barbiewild.com. You can follow me at Barbie Wild, Twitter. Just remember, it's Barbie like the doll and Wild like Oscar. Um, and then it's Barbie Wild at Facebook. And I also have Barbie Wild author actress at Facebook. So the, between all these things, you can pretty much keep up with what I'm I'm doing. Um, <laughs> How about you? Nicholas? I've never said that before. Barbie like the doll and Oscar and Wild like Oscar. <laughs> I like that. You should put that on. You should put that on your uh, on your web page so people get it right. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I, mostly, I'm, I keep uh, my, there is a website www.nicholasevince.com, uh, www. but I haven't updated it in ages. Um, so, I, to, to be honest, you'll mostly find me on Facebook. Um, I tend to update or check Facebook regular, regularly, probably far too regularly. Um, but uh, people can and do get hold of me through Facebook. Uh, it's either with Nicholas Vince or Nicholas Berman hyphen Vince, um, which is my married name, my legal name now. Um, that's where you find me. Um, you will. I'm also on Twitter uh, as uh, Nicholas underscore Vince. Um, you'll find me there. Okay, and Simon. Well, as Michael, as you, as you now know, I'm pretty awful at keeping up with Facebook and Twitter, but I am on Twitter. Um, I'm at Simon Bamford, um, just as, as he is, at Simon Bamford. Uh, and I have a Facebook account in my name, too. And uh, SimonBamford.com is my website. Um, but I'm pretty terrible at uh, keeping up to date with people. But um, I am there occasionally, I promise. <laughs> well, guys, again, thank you for being on. And once again, we would like to say thank you to Barbie Wild, Nicholas Vince, and Simon Bamford, the female, the chatterer, and the butterball from Clive Barker's Hellbound Hellraiser 2. We do want to apologize for the technical difficulties at the beginning of the interview. Sometimes the Internet and or phone systems do not work as we always anticipate. And just so you know, yes, that was a taped interview, of course, with all of them being in England and me being uh, on the east coast of the United States, if they were to have done a live interview with me right now, it would now be 2.30 in the morning. So we set that one up in advance. But once again, we do want to say thank you to them. Um, We truly appreciate all the work that you guys have done and continue to do. You are a more than welcome addition to the Horse Society family. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to go into our second uh, Metal Blade Records spotlight of the evening. Of course, the band is Hail of Bullets. The album is Three, The Rommel Chronicles. The name of the song is To the Last Breath of Man and Beast. Now at least 
Chronicles. The name of the song was To the Last Breath of Man and Beast. Once again, Hail of Bullets is in our Metal Blade Spotlight tonight. And just to give you a quick review of the CD, you know, war and death metal based historical fact subgenre of metal is, you know, I never was really into it in the past, but this album made me think about it just a little bit more. Um,. The band features members from previous and present bands like um, Asphyx, Gorefest, Thanatos, and Howitzer. And this is the third studio album from Hail of Bullets. And, you know, when I wrote the review for it, you know, with it being based on historical, you know, historical war events and, you know, a person... You know, when you listen to it, really, it does. It has a technical precision that is that is reminiscent of a well-planned military strike. You know, the tracks uh, to the last breath of Man and Beast, which we just listened to, um, Swoop of the Falcon, and D.A.K. Um, I have to tell you, man, you know, Martin Van Drunen, uh, he's a lead singer. Um, Paul Bayens, who's on guitar. Stefan Gabetti, who's also on guitar. Theo Van Ekelen, who's on bass, and Ed Warby on drums. I'm, I'm telling you, man, it, it's like a machine gun. These, these guys just pound it, pound it out. Um, the album does have like it does have an almost epic feel to it, but it's not. It's got enough rawness and grit to it that it's it's not like an opera style. And you know, I think that's a good thing if you like your metal harder. So definitely, definitely good stuff. And uh, again, the album focuses on the military life, rise, and fall of German Field Marshal Erwin Rommel. And um, I'm telling you, man, after you listen to this, you feel like you just got off the battlefield. If you like Bolt Thrower, um, again, we had mentioned Asphyx, God the Throne, who I'm a big fan of, you'll dig this. Um, if you're more of a cannibal corpse and decap- cattle decapitation kind of guy, um, there's still plenty here for you to listen to and enjoy. So definitely pick this up. You can check them out on MetalBlade.com. They have their own website as well. Uh, you can check them out on Facebook. Um, they do have a Twitter. I'm not really sure if it's an official Twitter, so I'm not sure about all that. And like I said, you can definitely get their album on iTunes as well. So we want to say thank you to Metal Blade Records for introducing us to Hail of Bullets our Metal Blade Spotlight of the Week. Stay tuned at the end of the show. We will have a special preview of next week's Spotlight Artist. But once again, uh, to close out the show, we are going to be doing a review from the Vincent Price Collection, Scream Factory's uh, outstanding release, uh, you know, the Vincent Price Collection with the movies that come in that. I mean, it's... It's it's disgusting that you can get that much good entertainment in one box. You've got Fall of the House of Usher, The Haunted Palace, The Mask of Red Death, The Pit and the Pendulum, and Witchfinder General, and let us not forget The Abominable Dr. Fibes. As a matter of fact, The Abominable Dr. Fibes and Witchfinder General will, will be two of the movies that we're discussing out of the box at this evening. But um, before we do that, I just want to let you guys know there is still a Blu-ray copy of John Carpenter's Body Bags and a Blu-ray copy of Chilling Visions, both from Scream Factory. If you would like to own those, please give us a call at 1-347-237-5099. On to our DVD review. 
Scream Factory. <laughs> what else needs to be said? Nothing else should be said at that point. The box set came out on the 22nd. It comes with those six films. There are a ton of special features included in this box set, including an amazing 24-page booklet that has tons of stills and and anecdotes and, and things like that. So, I mean, for nothing else, this is worth getting. But on to our two films. The first film that I watched out of the set, just because I hadn't seen it in years, was The Abominable Dr. Fibes. And to me, this is, always has been one of my favorite Vincent Price characters out of everything that he's ever played. So, you know, it's it's the transfer, again, without even having to say it, is absolutely stunning. There is an audio commentary with director Robert uh, Faust, and then we have audio commentary with author Justin Humphreys. And then there is an introductory price, Undertaking the Vincent Price Gothic Horrors. And what that was is there uh, there was a series on PBS that Vincent Price took part in. And what it was is there were there were several films of his that they did. And he did an intro and an outro to each one of his films. And what this is is basically the story of how that came to be. There's a lot of uh, behind-the-scenes archival footage, um, you know. And, and they talk about how Vincent was 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 a great great sport about all of it, and you know how much fun they all had on the set working with him. So, I mean, that was that was really nice to see. You had your theatrical trailers and your still gallery, but. Um, you know, Dr. Dr. Anton Fives, his wife uh, dies on the operating table, and the nine doctors who were in charge of her surgery, um, Fives is in a horrible car wreck on the way home and is horribly burned and thought to have died. Well, years later, Fives decides to get his revenge against all of them using, um, you know, like the biblical plagues and things like that to kill off his victims. And, you know, the ingenuity for its time, very bloody for its time, um, just very well done. You know, the disfigurement, the makeup, everything about the film. If uh, if it's one that you have not seen, it's it's definitely one that's that's one of his better. It's nice, uh, you know, it takes place in the, in, in the late uh, 20s, 29, 30, you know, dur- kind of during that Depression, Flapper, whole era. Um you know, like I said, the audio and the video are magnificent. The colors, the colors are bright the way they're supposed to be. You know, you you feel like you're looking at the real thing, like it's authentic. And and again, like I said, you can't say enough about about Price's depiction of of Fibes and, and just the brutal ways in which he goes about knocking off uh, his intended victims in the film and the surprise ending. You know, at the end, and then you know, years later, there you know, a year later or so, there was. A sequel, so the character of Fives have, all, have always felt would would be good to see again. I remember um, there were always some rumors of, of it being remade, but I haven't seen anything recently. Now, the other film that uh, I watched as part of that was The Witchfinder General. Now, in America, we all may remember the, the film under the title of The Conqueror Worm, and that was done so that the film could fit into AI Pictures releases with the Edgar Allan Poe series that they were doing. But um, what's nice with Witch, with, with Witchfinder General, when you watch that one, you can actually watch, you have the option of watching it with the introduction that he gave from the, uh, from the Vincent Price Gothic Horror series he did on public television. So I thought that was that was a really nice uh, bonus to watch the film that way. Um, there's audio commentary from let's see, producer Philip uh, Wadalove and actor Ian Ogilvy. Um, you had a featurette, uh, the Witchfinder General, Michael Reeves' horror classic. There are classic interviews or vintage interviews, as they call it, with Vincent Price that were conducted by film historian David Deval that were. Uh, 1987 Uh, there's Vincent and Victoria an interview with uh, Victoria Price there's the theatrical trailers and there's a bunch of other Vincent Price trailers on that as well 
still gallery, the whole nine. And, you know, this one this one was really surprising, too, getting a lot of the backstory on it, which I had never had the opportunity to hear, how he and the director Reeves, you know, Reeves didn't want Price on the set. He didn't want him as his lead actor, and uh, it led to some rather tense moments on the set. So then, you know, Prince's – or Prince's – um, Vincent Price's performance, um, you know, very serious the way he played it. And, and again, this is one of the more bloody films if you think about it. In, in his in his film library, you know, came under came under some fire overseas. A couple places refused to play it, play it because of the content. Um, you know, pretty brutal stuff. But again, it's one of those. It's one of those roles where you look at Vincent Price and you you just see how dynamic he can be with um with just the plain cruelness and the coldness that he plays his character with. It's absolutely stunning. Um definitely worth seeing. Um would be a great film to watch with films like Mark of the Devil and and things like that. So, if you're into the whole the witchcraft, the torture, Spanish Inquisition kind of type stuff, the Conqueror Worm, a.k.a. the Witch, Witchfinder General, is definitely for you. Now, these are just the first two films I've watched in the box set. There are still four more. I am still going through all the special features, so the written reviews of this will take a little bit of time to get to the public, but rest assured they're coming, as will be reviews of the rest of the films in the series. So... Once again, we want to say thank you to Scream Factory for sending the Vincent Price Collection along for a review. We reviewed the Witchfinder General and the Abominable Dr. Fives from them, both excellent quality, um, excellent bonus features, so well worth picking up, especially with Christmas on the way. If you have a horror fan or a Vincent Price fan in your family, this is definitely something to get them. We also want to say Thank you once again to Metal Blade Records for letting us have Hail of Bullets in our Metal Blade Spotlight tonight. The name of the CD was Three, The Rommel Chronicles. The songs were To the Last Breath of Man and Beast and the other one has disappeared on me. This is strange. Well, to the breath. Sorry about that. The final frontier was the first song we played by them this evening, and the second song was to the last breath of man and beast. So, apologize for that. Uh, internet connection is spotty, as is my studio picture here. So once again, we want to say thank you to Metal Blade and to Scream Factory. We also want to say thank you to Barbie Wilde, Nicholas Vince, and Simon Bamford for being on the show. So with that saying, we are about to close the show. And as we close the show, we will spotlight Metal Blade Records spotlight artist for next week. And that band is Satan's Wrath. The name of the song is Aeons of Satan's Reign, and the name of the song is Only Satan is Lord. And until next week, have a happy Halloween, and rest in peace.